Boys and girls, today I want to talk to a producer who has worked with bands like Pantera, Slipknot, The Deftones, Incubus, Static X, Prong, and many, many more. And he has dialed in the guitar tones on some legendary albums. I want to talk about dialing in guitar tones back in the days versus today. I want to talk about guitar speakers, about guitar amps. And of course, I want to talk about the brand new course that he has done for Cola Audio Cult, where he shows how he dials in his guitar tones, where he shows the gear he is using, guitar amps, cabs, speakers, microphones, you name it. More information about the course below and later in this video, but let's just dive right into the interview that we already did something like one and a half years ago. Anyway, time to say hello and welcome to Mr. Ulrich Wild. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yourself? I'm a little tired already. It's 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 9 p.m. and uh, but I'm very excited to talk to you. So uh, thank you Let's very much. Let's do this. So you are about to film a little course for the Cola Audio Cult. Can you Correct. tell the people what they can expect? Uh, we're going to just go through my setup. Um, the way I've been recording guitars, um, my philosophy about how to do it uh you know it, it's it's my way of doing it there's a thousand ways and everybody will tell you that their way is the best and here i'm i'm here to tell you that my way is the best um so you know that's basically what we're going to do and uh you, you also gonna record some multi-tracks that people can play with yeah we have some uh, di tracks and we're gonna basically reamp them um I'll, I'll go into the 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 philosophy of reamping versus live playing and all that stuff uh um, but uh, for for this purpose, the the reamping thing is is good because we can really dig into and, and, and compare the same performance with different microphones and, and and everything. Absolutely. And is there a go to rig that you have, or is that constantly changing? Um, I have some amps uh, available here at the studio, but I always like to start with uh, the setup that the band has um, uh -huh. because they. Unless they're a very young band and haven't had the experience with finding their tone yet, um, you know, most most guitarists seem to be obsessive about their gear, and they've they've worked themselves into their tone. That's kind of that's the starting place, you know. Like uh, I don't want to rip that out from under them uh, for no reason, unless they're unhappy. Unless the country is like, look, everything has always sucked. Uh, we need to. I need help. Then that's a different scenario. I've also been doing this for 25 years, and I think one thing that has really changed um, compared to whatever, 10, 15 years ago, it used to be like you described, that bands showed up here or guitarists showed up here with their personal rig, and that could be great or bad, whatever, but with a sonic vision in mind and gear, carrying in gear here. And these days, I think 90% of the metal productions are DI tracks, that are sent somewhere for reamping. So I very often just get the DI tracks and then it's up to me to decide how the band's gonna sound, which is fun for me, but I think it's one part of everything sounding more and more the same and more and more generic because you rip out the identity in a way. You know what I mean? Like I very much agree, yes. Um, it's it, uh, like the recording used to be a snapshot in time. Um, you know, you, you showed up at a studio you had you were two weeks or three weeks to record the album. Um, the gear was there. You didn't. You weren't able to download presets. You weren't able to download plugins or anything. Not that there was anything wrong inherently with any of that, but you weren't able to do any of that. And you, you, if you wanted to wait for an extra compressor or an amp, you had to wait for like a week or two to for it to get there, and that was half of your time, and you couldn't do that. So you had to make do with what was there, and uh, it it very much captured a moment in time. Like, and there was decision making, like on the go decision making uh, that was that was happening every waking minute of recording. You didn't have unlimited tracks. You had 24 or 48 and that was it. Like if you wanted to redo something, something else needed to be erased. So, you know, when the lead vocalist comes and asks, uh, you know, I, I want to redo my vocals because I think I can do better. And you listen to it and, and you're like, well, are you sure you want to erase this? <laughs> and they go like, ah, maybe that was actually really quite good. You know what I mean? And, and so this, this uh, back to the snapshot in time, uh, you had 
you know, there, there was a personality that was developing during recording and that decision making uh, has been taken away a, lo a lot and, and you get these DI tr tracks and, and you are there in retrospect making these decisions for them. And, and yes, you know, like the, the personality of you as a mixer is, is larger in the project yeah. than, than it used to be or should be. I don't know what the... And one difference that I also noticed is that back in the days when you were doing like full record sessions, as an engineer or producer, you could dive into that record. You were recording every single instrument. And when you were starting to mix the record, you really knew the songs inside out and you were really close and you had talked to everybody and there were there was no discussion. And now people just send you whatever, some MIDI drums, some DI tracks, and you know, tell you to make the record. And that is much more difficult. And again, I think makes things sound more and more the same and more and more boring. Yeah, I mean, that, that is definitely a, a drawback of, uh, you know, plugins, amp simulators, uh, Axe effects, boxes like that. If you use it the same way that we used to do it back in the day, which is like, here's the sound, this is what I'm recording, coming out of you know a Kemper, which is a great tool. You know, you make those decisions on the go and, and you show up with the guitar track with, you know, like there's one sound, uh, one finger, one performance. That's kind of like my, my, my uh, approach. Uh, I don't want to have four different microphones recorded. I want to have one sound. I don't want to have the DI. I just, you know, don't even give me the DI. You can have it in case you need it to reamp your thing later, but give me the drum sounds, give me the guitar sounds, give me that, you know what I mean? And that's how I record when I, when I record and produce a record. That's how I do it. I, I, I don't actually even record the DI tracks usually. So that means you all, so if you record several microphones, do you record several tracks or do you mix them right into? I mix them right together into a one sound. I do the same thing, but that's very, that's very old school. But Correct. Yeah. I mean, I always get asked, uh, you know, like, you know, what, what's the best sound? What's the best this? It was like, well, if you, if it's, if, if it sounds right, or is this good? You know, like, yeah, if it, if it sounds right to you, then it's good. You know, like yeah. that's, if you think it doesn't sound right, then it's probably not good, <laughs> you know, unless you've lost perspective along the way somewhere. Exactly. But if I ask you, what are your favorite high gain amps? You said you want to you want to listen to the band first, but just like your taste, your opinion. Um, I don't even know that I have like a favorite one. You know, um, I've been I've been really fortunate to have worked with many many uh, 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 different bands and, and great guitarists. They've all had their their sound. You know, any of the technology behind it, like cabinets and speakers and guitars and setups and all that stuff, is really so secondary to the player. Mm -hmm. You know, you could take any of these greats uh, away from their rigs and put them on any rig and they would sound like themselves, um, you know, with some obvious, obvious differences. You know, if you go from a, you know, from a, a, a Wagner Überschall to a Fender Twin, obviously you're not going to sound exactly the same, but the player is the same and you can recognize the player still. You know what's the best amps? Like the one that sounds right with the player, the one that you know, like the 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 the, the interactive, the one that the player likes. You know, you can have the best amp, and the the guitarist doesn't like it, and you, it's not going to be good. So that means the guitar player is the most important component in your signal chain, and teaching him to play well is uh, what makes the sound or what's most important. I, I think the eighty percent of the guitar sound is the right hand. Jig, jig, jig. Any uh, all the, the the way the pick, the guitars are attacked with the pick and the you know the, the strings are attacked with the pick, um, that is so undervalued. Everybody's always focusing on the the flashy bit, you know, on the 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 left hand and how many notes can you play and how many scales you know and all that stuff. But how good you make it sound is how your brain interacts with your right hand. I agree, especially I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rhythm metal guy, you know, so the right hand is crucial all the time. That's what I've been telling people. But uh, let's go back to the signal chain. What I've been telling people is that the speaker is, or let's say the cabinet and the speaker, for me is actually the most important part of the whole rig because it totally shapes um, the guitar tone. And for me, it's more important than 
than the amp and the guitar when we talk about rhythm metal tones. And um, uh, I've been showing a lot of different speakers on my channel, channel to, to prove that. Uh, because the whole metal world has been dominated by the vintage 30 in the last 20 years. What are you using? Are you using different speakers or are you a vintage 30 guy or how important are speakers for you? Tell me something about speakers. I have been going down the speaker rabbit hole over the pandemic. Um, ah. I, I, saw, I caught your video with uh, the, the V30 video. The, yeah, the, the, um, and I've, I've come to, I'm not going to say dislike V30s, but I just find them ordinary at this point. Um, the one thing that happened to me is I, I lucked into um, an amp manufacturer called Albion. Uh, they no longer exist, unfortunately, um, but the, the fellow, uh, Steve Grindrod, has his new company, I think it's called Grindrod simply. Um, he used to design for Marshall, and he made this amp, I think you can see it in the back there, it's an Albion amp. Um, uh, that amp is cool because you can actually mix the two channels together, like you can have a clean sound and a distorted sound on top of one another, which is really neat. Oh, wow. And I don't see that very often, or, no. or ever, really. Um, and so he, they also made a, a, a cabinet, and uh, that is probably so far my favorite cabinet. Just proprietary, like Albion speakers uh, in there, and they just sound a little cleaner. Um, and, and, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a less distorted kind of way, but it just sound, uh, have, have a little bit of a sheen on top of a V30 and have a little less mud in them or just a little, Transparent or something. Or Let's just say that, that that cabinet beats out all the other cabinets about uh, eighty percent of the time. Oh wow! I've never heard about them. I really need to Google that after our conversation. Albion, okay, Albion. But you can you can find them around. I've, I've seen them up, uh, you know, uh, up and to uh, every once in a while. In uh, <laughs> see, up and to <laughs> that was a little German. <laughs> a little German <laughs> words uh, sneaking in every once in a while. Um, uh, I see it on like eBay or whatever, or Reverb or you know any of these okay. sites. Every once in a while, something shows up. And what what other less exotic speakers? So I ended up diving into uh, that Albion speaker. The model name of the actual speaker is AMI eighty sixteen. You know, in case anybody's wondering. But um, so I thank you. I sort of have my favorite metal speaker, which is that Albion one. So I want to have a more diversified uh, uh, outlook on, on guitar, guitar tones. I, I bought a, 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 a Framus, an empty Framus cabinet, and just chucked the speakers in it and uh, moved some stuff around. I had another Randall cabinet that was chock full of V30s that took some of them out. Ended up with um, the H75 Creamback, um, uh, a, a G12K100, and... Um, Ended up with an Eminence uh, Swamp Thing. Oh, that's a good speaker. I like I like blending that one with Vintage 30s. That's a great speaker. And then I have the Warehouse Guitar Speakers, uh, the Reaper, and the G12 CS. So that means you are using a lot of different speakers. That makes me happy. That makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it, especially when you when you need a cleaner sound, like the V30s end up being not really nice for for cleaner sounds, or you know, just to to change things up because everybody's using that V30, everybody's using the same sound, everybody's doing the same yeah. thing. It has become a little boring. That's that's how I started. Yeah. Yeah, checking out other speakers. A lot of them don't work for metal, but. Um, it's a lot of fun, and I think it's the easiest way to really change your tone like completely. Switching from one speaker to another is, for me, it's mostly more interesting than switching from whatever, the Soldano to the Angle Amp, where the difference is usually a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, so, so are you going to show us uh, that Albion speaker in the video for the Cola Audio Cult? I really want to hear it. Uh, yes, I am going to do that. The Albion cabinet changed to a um, basically a, a V30 uh, comparison cabinet. Uh, I have two of those Albion speakers in it, the Reaper and a V30. Um, and so the, they're basically the same neighborhood of speakers, um, mm -hmm. but you just get a little bit of a different flavor from each one of them. Um, so that's, that's my standard metal cabinet, I guess, if you will. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, and the other cabinet I have is um, the one that has the, the G12 K100 in it, and, and also an Albion, and also a V30 and the Swamp Thing. So that's mm -hmm. my kind of like my more metal cabinet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have the alternative cabinet that has the um, the G12 CS from Warehouse and uh, uh, the cream back and of course an Albion speaker as well. But awesome. I'm really looking forward to hearing all those speakers. Makes me really happy. Very cool to hear that. Next question. So, so I can see a camper amp behind you. And uh, for me, that was when the camper came out, that was a game changer. That was the first digital tool that I started using for, for high gain tones. Uh, but yeah, how much of your go-to signal path is still analog? How much are you, you using the camper? How much are you using plugins these days? Um, I can't, cannot give you a percentage here. Um, when I record, it's always try the amps first. Um, I consider the camper just another amp. Uh, and when I do record it, I record it through the Albion cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find that it just gives that a little bit of extra breath in there. So you're not you're not even using the direct out. You're always my. I have. Account. I have. It's not. You know, that's the whole thing. I'm 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 not an always and never kind of guy. Um, it's it's whatever works, uh, whatever works in the situation. If if somebody is under time pressure or has a solo in their head that need to get out it's a camper and in and out and quick or just a di whatever you know, whatever needs to happen when you know it's like what's the best camera it's the one that takes the picture when you have the situation happening you know um it's what's yeah. the best microphone it's the one you have in your hand when you have the ideas you know what i mean that's <laughs> you know what i mean that's that's kind of how yeah, I yeah, right and what about what about plugins uh, same thing you know, I, I have some really, there's some really cool amp sims and plugins that are out there now. Um, and and uh, that, you know, goes to the IRs. If you put your own IRs in there, it's like basically you're engineering your own, your own plugin, you know? I have one more question. I just did a video about the Marshall Valve State, which was my first amp when I was, I don't know, 15, 16 yeah, years yeah, old yeah. in the 90s. And it sounded so fucking brutal. <laughs> then I learned like, hey, there's actually some better sounding amps out there, some real tube amps. So I, you know, got rid of it. And then I revisited it after 20 years or something and finding out it's actually there's something two dimensional and weird about it, but it has that tone and it's, and I was looking for people who actually used it. And it turned out and on a lot of cool albums, people used the Valve State. And one of the bands was Static X. So did you happen to use a Valve State? Is that true? Yeah, um, I still have that very same one uh, that we used on Wisconsin Death Trip. So that was yours and not the band's? Who, who decided? It came about with uh, Prong, actually. I think Tommy mm -hmm. Victor was using them for that Rude Awakening. Do you also work with Prong? Mm-hmm, on that Rude Awakening album. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, they, and they also used the Valve State, right? Huh? I think so, yeah. I think that's how I was turned on to it. And it, it was a, it, it, there was something about that distortion that, I forgot what we used it on besides guitars, but it sounded cool to have other stuff run through it. And that's how I ended up with it. It's kind of like as, as a distortion pedal more than anything else. Um, but, uh, you know, like Wayne was looking for that really chunky, you know, sound. Between his search for tone and Pantera uh, and their, their uh, Randall solid state heads, mm. we uh, just ended up trying it. And it, it sounded great. Uh, recording, but he wasn't convinced that it would be great for live. Um, but he changed his mind towards the end of the, the the recording session. Awesome! It's cool because those were pretty cheap amps in comparison, yeah, a couple right? Hundred, and, couple hundred uh, bucks, like four hundred bucks. It's just yeah. it's just cool to hear that they actually used the Valve State. That makes me happy again. But yeah, Ulrich, thank you very much for this interview, and I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing the results of the videos you're gonna make for the Cola Audio Cult. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Back in 2022. So if you want to learn from Ulrich Weil, if you want to see him dialing in guitar tones, if you want to get to know his entire rig, all his speakers, amps, mics, and if you want to see him micing cabinets, blending mics, and EQing guitar tones and all that stuff, uh, you should check out the course. 
The course is not only interesting if you are working with real cabinets, but also if you are working in the box and if you are only moving virtual mics inside plugins. Anyway, it's a cool adventure. So check out the course. There's a link below. One more important information. There are two ways to get there. One way is to simply purchase the course. The other way, and that is a lot smarter, is to become a member of Cola Audio Cult. Because that way, you get so much more. You get access to all the courses we have released so far and will be releasing in the future. Tons and tons of course material. You can download multi-tracks. You can get in touch with me. It's all in there. Uh, so that's much smarter. Once again, either you just get that course or you become a member of Cola Audio Cult. Get that course as well, but a lot more. Two links below, you choose. But I would love to welcome you inside the cult. I think that's all for today. Um, I see you in hell, my friends. I see you in hell, motherfuckers. Thanks for watching. Check out Ulrich Wilde's course. Bye-bye.